Hi there, on the bench an old stereo amplifier with a problem description that one channel is no longer working. I connected it to my current limited light bulb and hooked up a signal generator and speakers. Let's power it on. After a moment a relay clicks and I can hear faintly the test tone. Increasing the volume slider causes a lot of crackly noises. Better turn the signal generator down a bit. Yes, the volume control definitely needs cleaning. And the balance control as well. But that reveals that only the right channel is working. The schematics is a little bit confusing at first sight because this amp was made for several geographic regions and they have slight differences, yet they all covered in the same schematic. There is a model for the US, Canada, AEP, which I think stands for Asia Europe Pacific, and then confusing an E model, which is also Europe, and finally a UK version. By comparison, I found out that I have the E model that somehow ended in the UK on my bench. Anyway, the basics are the same for all models. All amplification is done in one of those hybrid audio amplifier ICs from the 1980s. The rest of the audio part of the schematics is passively switching the inputs to the hybrid IC and then putting the output to the headphone and speaker sockets. Apart from that hybrid IC, the only other active audio circuit is the preamp for the phono input. Everything else in the audio part is just passive components. Interestingly, the tone controls are not part of the input circuitry, but in the feedback loop of the hybrid IC. The power supply provides a smooth plus minus 35 volt rail for the hybrid IC and a stabilized plus minus 15 volts for the phono preamp, the LEDs on the front and a rather elaborate circuit that drives the relay to protect the speakers. This part does two things. Firstly, a power up delay in connecting the speakers after the amp had time to stabilize. Secondly, it monitors both outputs and if it detects a DC voltage, it disconnects the speakers. This protection was needed with these hybrid ICs because a common failure mode could put large DC voltages on the output, thus frying your speakers. Thankfully, the schematics contains annotations with the expected DC voltages at various places, so that's the first thing to check. Starting with the supply rails, although since one channel works, I don't expect any problems. The negative supply voltage is ok, and so is the positive supply. Checking the voltages around the hybrid IC, always comparing the two channels. Minus 26 volts for the working channel should be minus 29 on the schematic, but in the ballpark. Only minus 19 volts for the non-working channel, hmm, let's test some more. On the working channel, this pin of the hybrid IC is minus 1.3 volts, which is exactly what it should be. Plus 29 volts on the other channel, that's no good. The minus 19 volts instead of minus 29, or maybe minus 26, is this one. And the plus 29 volts instead of minus 1.3 volts is this one here. All other voltages are ok. I also checked the components, resistors and capacitors and they are all fine. The sad conclusion is that one channel in the hybrid IC is dead and the whole chip needs to be replaced. Not easy. These were made by Sanyo in the 1980s and are long obsolete. The market is full of knockoff replacement chips and while the original has quite decent specs, the quality of the replacements is highly variable, if they work at all. I finally picked one seller and ordered one. While the chip was on the way, I decided to have a go at the other issues, starting with the crackling volume control. That was easily accessible once I removed the PCB from the front section. I applied contact cleaner, but it was still a bit noisy. The PCB connections are all soldered on, but the wire lengths are quite generous, and I thought the section with the volume control may just fit into my ultrasonic cleaner without desoldering. That cleaning bath followed by a 24 hour dry out worked much better. It's still not completely silent, but definitely usable. While examining the complex mains voltage selector, I discovered that one wire of the mains cord had been caught under the mounting bracket and nearly squashed. It is amazing that this did not short against the chassis. Is this original Sony quality? 
I can't think why anyone would have tried to remove and reinstall the voltage selector. This whole amplifier is amazingly unsafe by today's standards. First of all, this amp with all its metal enclosure needs to be earthed. I decided to remove the fixed two-wire line cord and instead mount an IEC C6 socket that takes a C5 clover leaf plug, just nibbling a bit around the hole for the original power cord and the new socket fits neatly. Then drilling two holes for holding it in place and that's done. All these mains connections inside are just waiting to be accidentally touched while servicing, like for example the fuse holders here. The wires are actually not soldered but wire wrapped. To make this safer requires to unwrap each cable, put heat shrink over it and then solder the wire back on and cover the exposed part with the heat shrink. It's not perfect but I feel a lot safer while working this amp if there aren't all these exposed metal posts live at mines voltage. I considered removing the three Japan style main sockets at the rear. They have power when the amp is on to power for example a record player but then decided to leave them in. Well the new chip finally arrived so I desoldered the old one. It's a bit messed up because there was so much heatsink compound. And here is the replacement which hopefully works. Because the new chip felt much lighter I decided to weigh both. The original part weighs 41.5 grams while the new one just 31.9, nearly 10 grams less, which is worrying. I actually contacted the seller and they said this was okay as it's a different construction inside. Hmm, well let's give it the benefit of the doubt. After giving the new chip a generous helping of heatsink compound, I mounted it on the heatsink. The heatsink itself is removable which makes removing or adding the IC very easy. After the chip is secured, I put the heatsink back in its original place and screwed it onto the chassis. The final job is to solder the IC into the PCB connecting it to the rest of the amp. Well, after a quick test it worked, but when I tried to do some more exhaustive tests I discovered another problem. Intermittently either channel would fail. To cut a long story short, I traced it down to the relay which was sensitive to mechanical knocks. The scope here shows the left and right signals at the speakers. I desoldered the relay and opened it. It seems to work. I hooked up a multimeter in continuity mode and there was no contact when the relay was closed. I applied contact cleaner directly and then on a piece of paper which I slid through the closed contacts and I repeated that a few times. It seemed to work but only for a short time. A search on the internet revealed that this relay model was used in a lot of amps from Sony and others at the time and it had racked up quite a history of failing. The contacts are probably worn out and no amount of cleaning will make this work reliable again. So time for a new relay. Double pole relays are much cheaper and easier to get in the common double pole double throw configuration which means they have two additional contacts and therefore pins. The extra pair of pins means that it won't fit into the holes of the PCB. Well, that can be fixed easily enough. And here it is installed. With the output now finally stable, I spent some time investigating the new chip. And it wasn't good. The first problem is a small DC offset on one channel. The two traces should be on top of each other but the blue one is shifted downwards by 25 millivolts or so. That isn't enough to trigger the DC protection circuit and unlikely to harm speakers but it may cause some distortion. Much more serious and very noticeable at higher signal levels are problems with the bias setting on both channels which causes distortion at the zero crossing points. Unfortunately that's all inside the chip. If that looked bad, at higher frequencies the signal is anything but clean and for example piano music sounds terrible with this chip. I desoldered and returned the chip and the seller refunded me with no quibbles and I ordered another one from another vendor. When it arrived it did not look new to me. At least it had the right weight, so this one may be an original chip salvaged from an old amp. Despite its looks, 
I decided to give it a try. You know the drill by now. Give it a coating of heatsink compound, mount it on the heatsink, align its pins with the connection PCB and solder it in. And it's totally dead. I got a full refund and both vendors did not want their chips back, which is encouraging so they're not just selling them to the next customer. I could continue with that in the hope that eventually I will get a chip that works, but where's the fun in that? Can I make this work without the dreaded STK465 hybrid? Join me in part 2 of this repair video. If you like my videos, don't forget to subscribe and maybe consider becoming a Patreon. That would really help this channel. The link's in the description. Thanks for watching.